to tape it, and then once once it's done, then to to put it up. But I wanted to to see if there's a if there's any kind of chance of uh, of getting people to uh, to to watch it. You know, if, if it works, it works. Okay. Anyway. Everything till now, right? This is all repetition. Everybody's like swimming in this material. There's nothing. <laughs> you're marinating. I thought you were going to say you're marrying with the material. <laughs> yeah, right. Does anybody need water? Okay. Yeah, sure. So I'm not I'm not sure if it if it stops or not. You know, it would be interesting to see if somebody uh, watched it to know if it was continuing or not. Because suddenly the people that were there, I don't know if they're here. <laughs> Things a mess. She thanks. Mm-hmm. Okay. So so we said that in general there are two types of people in the world. There's people that are like Yosef and people that are like David. Yosef is described as a Ish Matzliach. He's a, he's a successful man. Kol asher yaseh atzliach. Everything that he does, he's successful. So, if you're a Yosef type of person, it's almost like you don't need to go through this whole process. It's almost like this is a... It happens naturally, without even thinking about it. As long as they, maybe, maybe if in this lifetime you build it up very strongly, then, uh, then if you need to come back again, maybe it'll be built completely. It's like it's in their DNA. Right. Their yeah. right. They're like, they can see what they want, yeah. and it goes through the, through the psychological process it needs to go through, and it's successful. Anyway, there are people though that are like King, King David, and he's a Baal Nafna. He's a he's a like a like a premature uh, baby. He's always about to die. He doesn't have life in him. To say it another way, he's always bankrupt. <laughs> he's bankrupt emotionally, maybe even spiritually. But most of all, he's bankrupt actively. He doesn't have enough life in him to do what he wants to do. So somebody who's like David Amelech really needs this, uh, this technique. He, he, he's building himself up every single day, all the time. So, King David gives us a technique that he himself developed based on what it says in the Torah. And it's one that can, that the sages say, this is uh, one of the most important uh, and valuable uh, tools that we have. And we started talking about it last time before I left for America. And we said this is what's called Nishba'in ala mitzvot. That you can make a vow on the commandments. What does it mean to make a vow on the commandments? If the person feels that he wants to do a commandment, he wants to do a mitzvah, but he's afraid that he doesn't have the strength to do it. So what does he do? He has to borrow from the future. He's borrowing from the future constantly. Now this is this is a whole change in, in, in how you look at time. We look at time as linear. That the past is gone, and the future is not here yet. Women do not look at it that way. Maybe. <laughs> and <coughs> the future is inaccessible. But we talked about this yesterday, yes. remember about Shabbos. Chazal don't see it this way. They say that for Shabbos, you can borrow 
in order to have a better Shabbos. What does that mean? That you don't have enough to buy everything that you need. So Hashem says, go borrow and I'll pay it back. Why? What's the idea here? The Shabbos is outside the regular, uh, call it the regular budget that you have. And if you need something more, you can borrow it and Hashem will pay it back. Why specifically for Shabbos? Why not for anything else? You can't do the same thing. Theoretically, you can't do the same. It doesn't say, at least, that you can do the same thing for a different mitzvah. The people do. <laughs> but they learn from Shabbos. Why do we learn it from Shabbos? Because Shabbos is me'en olam haba. It's about the future. Shabbos is really a 25-hour period that's giving us a glimpse of what the future is going to be like. So because it's 25 hours of the future, you can borrow. Because from the future, you're allowed to borrow. If it's to do a mitzvah. And then who pays it back? Incredibly, you would say, maybe you have to pay it back. No. The fact that you did the mitzvah, Hashem says, very good, that's what I wanted you to borrow for. And I'll pay it back. You don't have to pay it back at all. Levu alai v'ani poreh, says Hashem. The Navi says this. Borrow on my credit, and I'll pay it back. Where did this come from? Why dafka, why dafka the seventh day? Because the seventh day is also the same idea of shvua. Shvua, to, to make a vow. And by the way, I'm not sure if it's not the same word, actually because it sounds the same. Vow and Sheva might be very related. <laughs> so, to make a vow on the mitzvot, we learn this in Dvarim, that it says, Et Hashem elokech atira, v'oto ta'avod, u'vishmo tishavea. You shall fear Hashem, your God, and serve Him, and make a vow in His name. Says, says Rashi, or says the Gemara in Tmura, why does it say this twice? It says it again three chapters later. Almost the same wording, it just adds, Uvotidbak, you shall cling to him. So the Gemara says, why do you, uh, why do you, uh, why do you have two verses that say the same thing, and make vows in his name? So says the Gemara, one of them is to teach me that when I need to vow, make a vow in court, for instance, that I didn't, I wasn't a uh, I didn't do something wrong with something that was left for me to watch over. Okay. That, I, that, I, that I fulfilled my duties as, a, as, as somebody who's watching or guarding something. <coughs> or whatever else the basin decides I need to make a vow about. Like it's like a t- type of very strong testimony that I vow that I was okay or I vow that I never received this money, or whatever, whatever the vow might be, you should vow, make a vow in Hashem's name. Never make a vow in some other name, or some other idea. Don't vow on your mother or your father. And like people will say, I swear in my mother's, whatever. You swear in the name of Hashem. How do you do it? So, Basin has a way even of doing it today if they really need to, even though it's not really done. That's one pasuk. It says of Yishmo Where is that? Where it's in Dvarim Vav Yud Gimel. It's the first context, one. 613. Is it just? 613. 613, okay. <laughs> it's easy to remember. Okay. 6 colon 13. <laughs> and the other one is in 1020. It's also easy to remember. 1020. Dvarim 1020. So the first one is in the context of a basin. And the second one is in the, is in the context of just serving Hashem. It's like after the, after the Shema. Okay. So when you're serving Hashem, it says part of serving God is knowing how to make a vow in His name. What do I make the vow for? So that I have strength to perform the mitzvah. What am I doing really? I'm borrowing from the future. When I make a vow... I'm borrowing from the future. So somebody like King David, 
He doesn't have strength, he doesn't have the vitality needed to perform the mitzvah that he would like to perform. And he's constantly making vows. How do we know that? That's what he says. Nishbati v'akayema, nishmo mishpatei tzidkecha. I made a vow, I made a vow, nishbati v'akayema, and I will dutifully perform, nishmo to guard, mishpatei tzidkecha, the commandments of your righteousness. So he's constantly using a vow to borrow from the future the vitality he needs to perform what he wants to perform now. So we don't necessarily make vows because we're afraid to, to take Hashem's name in vain. What's the fear? The fear is that I won't keep my vow. But it's sort of like uh, paradoxical, right? Because the whole reason I'm making the vow is because I don't have the strength to perform the mitzvah. So therefore I have to make the vow. But I'm afraid to make the vow because maybe I won't perform the mitzvah. <laughs> Said, uh, we'll learn more about that uh, later. Like how do you get out of that kind of... It's a catch-22. It's, like, it's, it's, like it, it's almost like that the exile is taken away from us one of our most important tools in acting. <laughs> Might be. Might be. If you're crazy anyway, so you're taking Hashem's name all the time in a, in a vow. But let, let me mention something that uh, that is related to this. Um, when I was in America, I was bored, I guess. I couldn't, couldn't sleep because of jet lag. Mm-hmm. So I kept watching all kinds of old videos. The people talking. The people I never hear. I never get a chance to. And so there was this one uh, lady who... Uh, she mentioned what, she, what it was. So I don't know if I should say her name or not, but in any case, she said she thought it was important for... Um, when she does couples therapy to tell people that um, she herself, at one point in her marriage, wanted to, you know, throw in the towel. And that it's normal to feel that way. That it's important for people to hear that, from somebody that they think has a very good marriage. That if they hear that, then they'll know that it's uh, it's not wrong to feel that way. The question is, what do you do? That's what they would tell us to do. <laughs> <laughs> what, throw in the towel? No, to tell us to tell them that we have had that experience. Obviously, if you can't, uh, that's what we call transference. If you can't identify with the other person, with a therapist, having the same experiences that you have, mm-hmm. then um, how, can they, how can you help them? They have to feel that you have something of the same thing. But what troubled me was that in the end, it, 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 was sort, of, it, it sort of stayed as, uh, I had that feeling, and uh, somehow I got over it. Somehow. Right, doesn't help. And then I don't know how much now. that helps. Because <laughs> what you're saying is, um, I don't know, I, I was... Close to throwing in the towel, but then I guess Hashem saved me or something. <laughs> and then the person says, but Hashem's not saving me, so <laughs> how, is, how is this really, how do you help me? Okay? It's not very helpful, you're telling me that the miracle happened to you. So th- this is where this type of thinking has to come in. That you, I, I, we said it last time, that that's why the Christians have what they call wedding vows. Because a vow is borrowing from the future. It's taking from the future something that is going to give me strength in the present. You're right. At this moment in the present, I'm not like, like everything in life. At this moment in the present, I don't know how I'm going to pull through. But the future, I know, is going to be good. It'll get better. Because I know everything will work out in the end. And in fact, in the end, it's all redemption. It's all, it's all light in the end. So the question is whether I can take something from there. So to take something from there just to imagine everything's going to be fine, that's, that's very nice. 
But here what we're describing is that I'm not just imagining, but through the process of avowal, that we'll talk about in a moment, what it does exactly, it's like I'm borrowing from the future, the good state of the future, into the present. And I have to know how to do that. Because otherwise, right, it might be that if I'm just stuck in the present moment, I won't know how to get out of, a, out of the situation that I'm in. I will feel that all is lost. And then maybe I should throw in the towel. Maybe I should give up. You have to know how to do this. Like here it's like coaching. <laughs> it's like teaching somebody that to make a vow, as, as we'll discuss this process in a, in a moment, is really to give you strength to borrow from the future into the present. I can, I can relate to, um, once I got lost in the woods in California when I was young, I was five in the yeah. whatever. And I remember at night, alone in the woods, being lost, and um, borrowing from the future of being able to tell the story right. of how I was lost. Lost Imagine in the woods. That I was telling it, that I was already back with people, and that, I, and that somehow that gave me the strength in the moment, you know. Right. It's like an adventure. What? It's like an adventure that you can share afterwards. Right. It's the war story you'll be able to say, tell right. later. So the so transference is telling them that you did it. You're, you're giving them the strength right, by showing them you I'm, did it. I, I do it all the time. I know how to do it. <clears throat> But the, but the thing is, so let me just repeat it so that everybody can hear it. The, the, I heard this also when I taught it to the younger group. So Ruth Banai came up with this story that she used to do that a lot. She used to jump into the woods <laughs> in somewhere in upstate New York and get lost and face your fears. How do you get out of that situation? So she said, that's when you meet God. Right, that's why we also call it faith. That's why the future the, is all what people call meeting Hashem. Because the only thing that can hold you in, the, in this state, you can't rely on yourself anymore then, because you're so full of fears. So what you rely in, on is something that's beyond you. So there's beyond you in, in psychology, if you want, in the psyche. There's beyond you in time also. So... To take, to borrow from the future is to borrow from Hashem. That's really what it means. In that sense, the revelation of Hashem is always something that's in the future. Because there's always more revelation than the future. If you want to say it in a very poetic way, so you would say, after every night there is day. The sun eventually comes up. Come. You have to learn how to borrow from the sun coming up. But... That's not making a vow on the mitzvahs. That's just a normal human quality. Every human being, if they're lost and they're afraid, they'll eventually, hopefully, tap into this ability to think about the future and to borrow from it, borrow strength from it. That's not making a vow on the mitzvot. So what's the example of if you're talking Making a vow on the mitzvot is far more. What, but what, so you it's like what a, what a person says, that if I get out of this, ah, mm, okay, we used to all do that I will kids. do oh, this and this oh, mitzvot. Yeah, we all do okay? that as little kids. Yes. I Said remember it? doing that on an but, airplane. But get the, me through this and I'll do anything. But then you forget no, about it. No, I'll do anything is I, not good. Well, I'm shortening the story. It has to be... <laughs> something very specific. That there's a mitzvah that I want to do, and I don't just want to do it in, uh, in, 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 in 10 hours after I'm out of the forest. I'm, I'm going to do it now. In the forest? How do you okay. do it? Oh, so there's many stories like that about the Baal Shem Dov. The, the story usually goes that they drove somewhere on the wagon, in the middle of the forest, he stopped, and then he uh, he made a bracha or something like that, and they continued. Okay. He drank something. After the fact, he would say, the place that we stopped was where some Jew was buried, and uh, whatever, he needed the tikkun. So that's why I made a bracha there, and that was enough. 
Enough for what? To, to, to for get the out tikkun, of, to, okay. of the But when you understand it more deeply, what he's saying is to get out of the forest, you have to do a mitzvah. Really, so if you want to borrow... Trip. Okay. It's not, it wasn't a field trip. You build it in. <laughs> Afterwards, you can tell the story, like you said. Uh-huh. <laughs> like, uh... Afterwards, you've got your war story. But the point is, at that moment, there has to be a mitzvah. The mitzvah is what borrows from the future. Nishba'ina la mitzvot. And what better than to do a mitzvah right now? Not, not to wait something that will be in ten years. Or when I'm out of the forest. Something that you can do at this moment. If I can do something at this moment, I've, I've borrowed and people, and I've borrowed from the future and brought it into the present right now. So moment. in those stories, something would happen to the Baal Shem Tov. After that, he'd get into a mess and then he'd look back on it and say, the reason I got out of this mess is right, I because I did that mess. Because I did that mess. So the, that prepared already the energy for me to, in, in other words, like, like uh, Rabbi Nachman says, everywhere I'm going, I'm going to Eretz Yisrael. It's a mitzvah to be in Eretz Yisrael. Hmm. So all, all the places he's going always, for him, this is in order to go to Eretz Yisrael. That's, that's why I'm going in the first place. I'm always borrowing from the future time that I'll be in Eretz Yisrael, whether I'll, it's in this world, the next world, it doesn't matter. But that's where my consciousness is constantly focused. So that, that's called, that's the beginning of what it means to make a vow on the mitzvah. So vishmot tishavea, nishba'in lekayem et mitzvot But we don't use Hashem's name, but you can still use the same process. There's, no, there's nothing that prevents you, there's nothing wrong with saying, without a neder, you don't have to say a neder, you don't have to say a shua, just to say that I am performing this mitzvah for the purpose of getting out of here. Can we also do it the other way around? If I just say, take on not to... Because a friend was telling the story that she wanted to stop smoking, and it was very difficult for her. And she said, Hashem, if you help me stop... She took on a vow that she mm-hmm. would stop smoking. It's the same way. If I stop... That's the regular way. Right. That's what everybody knows is okay. Yeah. We're taking it one step even further. Mm-hmm. I'm saying even don't wait... Till then, like, like the Rebbe used to say, it, borrow now to do the mitzvah. Don't, don't wait till there's an opportunity. We used to say, like, well, if you want to give tzedakah, if you want to give tzedakah and you don't have money, what should you do? So borrow now. Why borrow now? Because it, because it's like you're bringing the future into the present, and in the in the end it'll work out. And you don't have to wait until you're out of the mess to do the mitzvah. To the point of, in the in the in the greatest uh, sense of it, it means that my most future, my greatest future self, can manifest right now. There's nothing stopping it, except for me to go out of time. Stop thinking of time as something linear, but rather think of time as energy that's just waiting there. You can use it right now. People say, uh, when I'll, uh, I don't know, <laughs> right, how, how does the, the Mishnah say? The Mishnah says, Don't say, when I'll have time, then I'll learn. Because maybe you'll never have time. What is that saying? Then the person really wants in the future to be a good person. He'll learn, and he'll dive in length, he'll do everything. But he says, right now I don't have time. So says the Mishnah, don't wait. <laughs> but he doesn't have time. You don't understand. Time is not, is not something that is limited. Time so, is not time dependent. <laughs> time is not, it's not a limited commodity. If you want to do it now, do it. Don't wait. Don't wait to be your better self. You can be your better self right now. Don't wait to be your higher self. Don't wait to fit, to become... You know, when I'm old and mature and then I don't have all these problems, then I'll start uh, serving God. Well, you can do it right now, where, where you are. Because not just where you are in the sense of the small person that you are now, you can, you can do it in the sense of the greatest person that you'll be. Right now. Really, that's what it means to be atzmi. 
Atzmi is somebody who you don't see him changing over time. Well, how could it be that he doesn't change over time? He doesn't mature like everybody? No, because from the moment that he understood this secret, that consciousness is not necessarily only in the present. You can borrow from your future consciousness. So then he just, forever, he's, he's in the future state. It's like, we're, and whatever moment he's in, he's already taking from his best future self and bringing it into where he is now. Like, it starts in the consciousness and it ends up in the Lumaisa. Okay. And, and the way he looks also. Up, One of the things that always struck me interesting about the Rebbe is that he's always somehow dressed like in the 90s. <laughs> Even in the 50s, when people had different hats, different style of everything, he looks exactly the way he looked in 1992. His beard is shorter, maybe, or less white. But his style, his style of clothing, <laughs> it's like from the 90s. It doesn't make any sense when you look at it. From the moment he became a Rebbe, he always looked... I'm not saying he looked old. It's not the old style. <laughs> It's the most modern style that was in the 1990s, the wide-brimmed hats. Everything in the 50s was narrow-brimmed. And yet he stands out. Look at the pictures from the 50s. It's very good. <laughs> he sticks out. Like he looks like he looked when he was in the 90s, in the 1990s. It's like he's always taking from the future. He's, ne he's never just in the present. The present for him is just a receptacle to receive all the all the all that he's taking constantly from the future, he's always his final self. He's always the greatest self that he can be. He's not in a process in, in that sense. Okay. But that's taking it to the to the greatest extreme. That's called atzmi in chassidus. But regular people, maybe we can't do it all the time, but there are moments when this becomes critical that I can take from the future, borrow from the future, and bring it into the present. But I especially need this if I'm like David. If I'm not su successful in and of myself. I don't have the vitality inborn into me. I, didn't, I wasn't born with it. I need to develop it. So to develop it really is to take it from the future. To, so how does this work? So the Shvua itself, the vow itself, is the whole crown of, of our being. Now, let's see something grammatical in Hebrew about making a vow. In Hebrew, you can't make a vow. There's no verb to make a vow. How do you say, I made a vow? In Hebrew? Yeah. Nishbati. Yeah. Nishbati. I was vowed. I was right. What? I was vowed. It's passive. It's always passive. It's never active. Li shava, uvoti shava, is... In him you will be made a vow. <laughs> this is the strongest hint that this is coming from the crown. Because the crown is not conscious. It's always passive for me. Whatever comes down from my crown, whatever is the super consciousness, is always in a state of not being actively done by me. It's like it's happening to me. That's probably the reason why it's so hard for us to make vows the right way. <laughs> because we really can't make a vow in Hebrew. The shava means to be vowed. It's a nif'al. That's the binyan. It's a passive binyan. It's a passive construct. You can't say, there's no... Um, you would have to say, nishboa. There is no such thing. Li shava is like li lakach, to be taken. Okay. It's, I, this happened to me. There's something very deep about this idea in Hebrew that you can't say it as an act 
that you do, but rather it was done through you, or it's done to you. Whereas in English you can. Whereas in English they, they think they can. <laughs> they think you can make a vow. So that's the limit of language. But it doesn't mean that Hebrew speakers necessarily right. realize this. And sometimes you think that... Uh, but, it, but this is like the deep psychological reason for why we don't make vows today. Because it's like an, an understanding that you can't really make a vow. It has to be made to you, or made through you. So maybe I can't do it actively myself. So you're kind of asking Hashem to help you make it. Right, so that's why we say that the whole, uh, the, this whole story begins with a sense of bittel. It starts with, right, it's not, we're not coaching in the sense of, okay, what's your wildest dream? You want a 7,000 square foot house? Okay, start envisioning it, think about it, then make it happen. No, because the whole idea here is that it's only what, through your nullification to Hashem, appears as your life's mission. It's not just whatever you feel like you want, some desire that came out of nowhere. Because you saw somebody else's car, you saw somebody else's house. It's because this is my mission in life. Where did my mission come from? I didn't invent my mission. That Hashem gave me. And I can only reach that through my... Keter, through my superconsciousness, through a sense of nullifying myself before God and saying, what is my mission? So on the one hand, it's a paradoxical state. On the one hand, I'm advocating for this mission. On the other hand, a mission by definition means that it's not really my choice. It's something. You can. On the one hand, the only you choose, this is where free will is. On the other hand, I'm saying, what you can choose is a mission given to you already by the Almighty. That's the whole nature of the crown, is always this paradox. And that's, that's the, maybe, you, you can skip it if you want, uh, if you don't get it 100%, but, but in essence, there's always something about the vow that is beyond me. That it's not me performing it. Okay. So that's that's Nishbati. And then says David Amalach, says King David, Nishbati Vakayema Lishmo Mishpatei Tzitkecha. So without getting into Vakayema Lishmo, which is also a Torah in and of itself, what if, what I just want to focus on is Mishpatei Tzitkecha. There's five words here. So in, in general, these, this is a Yud Kei Vav Kei with the tip of the Yud. Right, Nishbati is the tip of the Yod, and Mishpatei Tzitkecha are the Vav Hei. What are the Vav Hei of Hashem's name, or Mishpatei Tzitkecha? Mishpatei. 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 The commandment, or the laws of your righteousness. What are those about? The Vav Hei. So, when we begin uh, davening in the morning, we say, L'Hashem Yichud Kutsha Brichu V'Shechintei. In order to unify the Kadosh Baruch Hu Hashem, with His Shechina, with His Divine Presence. That's the general intent behind all the mitzvot that we do. It's to unify God's transcendent with His imminent aspects. It's a general thing. Can I just ask, if we're talking about the Bath Cave yet, yeah. Where does the Yudkeh come in? The Yudkeh is V'akayem alishmo. It's Kiyum and Shmira. Kiyum is the Chochma, and Shmira here is the Bina. I said I don't want to get into them because they're not uh, so important to what you want to say here. Discussion, okay. So says King David, why am I, why am I making a vow? For Mishpatei Tzitkecha, for this general intent that's behind the mitzvot. Now we can understand this better. It's not that he physically doesn't have the strength to do a mitzvah. He might have the physical strength needed. He might even have the time. But what's missing is that the mitzvah is not complete in the sense of unifying God's transcendence with his imminence. In other words, the mitzvah is not... or 
says David about himself, I don't have enough strength to make everything come down into reality. I don't have enough strength to have the right intent when I'm doing a mitzvah. That I don't have. So it can be that really I want to also do something that's beyond my means. So for instance, a person who, um, say, Val Chuvo is now starting to keep Shabbos. It's very hard. So simply make a vow. You don't have to say Hashem's name. But you vow to yourself, I'll keep Shabbos as Shabbos. That itself will give the strength. So that could be just to do an act. But even if you're doing actions, like we know that we do actions, a lot of mitzvot that we do all day long, and they, they're lacking the inner kavanah, they're lacking the inner intent. So that is also included in here. The only thing is with a vow. We've been told and it's been drummed into us, never make a vow, never make a vow, because mm-hmm. it has negative. So if you say, I'm vow to keep Shabbat, yeah, and no, then Shabbat. You, don't, you don't manage to keep your break, you Isn't didn't say there Hashem's a huge name. negative kind of thing there? Then? But, but that's the whole thing. Why would you not be able to? If you, <laughs> if you, if you really but make if a vow. Right, but that's why I think we're scared to, because mm-hmm. we might make it, but what if we don't? So you know? you're not saying yeah, Hashem's name. You're thing. not making Hashem's name, and even you say it in English, it's even less meaningful. But the whole idea here is, even if you just think it, that already is bringing down the strength, the, the strength to be able to do it. You get partial credit. A vow seems to come from the from the right song. So, say again. From the right song. Right. That's where we kind of right. access our song from. Right. All the right song gets right. Right. the the core for the vow. Mm-hmm. You've got to connect uh-huh. there somehow. It's saying that the ratzon itself, for me to have will to do something, I have to take from my faith, mm-hmm. from my radla. So really, what the vow is doing is taking from. The radla into the will. That's really what it's doing. So let me explain that in a moment. Why is it? Why, what's the connection between, between vow and seven? Why is there a connection? In Hebrew, shvua and sheva are the same, the same, 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 root. same root entirely. The explanation in, in the Arizal is that the shvua. Say it another way. When you say Shavua, what does Shavua mean? A week. A week. It's kind of the opposite from what we're talking about. If you, it was a week with an A, <laughs> it's like that you're weak. Uh, yeah. Here it's that you become strong. So what is, what is a, what's the idea here? That, that Radla is the top four Sfirot of Atik. Atik's full name is Atik Yomin. Is the Ancient of Days. How many days does he have? Take a guess. <laughs> seven. Because apart from the top spirot, there's also seven lower spirot. And those seven lower spirot are what you're populating. That's why it's called the Shavua. You're taking from the Radla, the top four spirot, and populating Atik's lower seven spirot, which are seven, which are called Yomin. They're called... That's why it's called Atik Yomin. He's ancient of days. What days? The days are the seven spirot of Atik from Chesed to Malchus inside him. You're populating them. And when you populate them, it is what dwells within will. So it strengthens will. And then eventually it comes down to your midot, to your character traits, and it strengthens them also. They refer to the ancient of days, which is the past. And right. so Atik mean means that he's above the days. So really, Atik just by itself, that's why it's sometimes called Atik Kadisha. Kadisha means separate, the like holy. Atik Kadisha is really talking about the Radla. That's one of the Giluim of the Arizal. But whenever the Zohar says Atik Kadisha, it's different than just Atik. Atik Yomin is like you're saying all 11 Sfirot, all 10 Sfirot, if you want, of the whole Pratsuf. When you say just Atik HaKadisha, you're just talking about the three top, which are above, they're, they're divorced, they're separate from the lower seven. Why? Because the lower seven are enclosed in Arich, and the top three don't enclose in anything. So, it's all technical. The three, so the three above. Okay. Three. 
But what's the important thing here? That this also, because we said it affects your characters, it's, there are seven of them. There are seven powers in every vow. So that's really the only way to refine character. The character traits are the seven from Chesed to Malchus in my conscious self, from loving kindness to kingdom in myself. How can I refine them? I have to bring something down. And I bring it down through a vow. That I vow to act a certain way. Meaning vow is more, making a vow is better than habit. Habit is just I repeat the same thing many, many, many times. Eventually it sticks, or it doesn't. You could, say, okay, you could say that it's just Ari acting without Atik. But when I make a vow, I'm actually bringing down something higher, which refines my character traits. Okay? This obviously doesn't act for no, <clears throat> work for non-Jews. Why not? Who does it? I know. Let's ask them. We need to try. <laughs> You're saying it's the only way to refine character? No, not, not the only way, be. but it's much better than habit. So this is a completely opposite idea to behavioral therapy. Right. You're going right. exactly in right. different directions. It's completely cognitive, yeah. but it's not even cognitive because we're, yeah. saying, <laughs> because we're saying that the shvua, the, the vow, is really from a higher place. Even. It's higher than the intellect. It's, I can't even it's do it myself. It's like it's being done through me. It's trans- yeah. Yeah. It's, a, it's a transcendental effect. Can I just say what people bring through these experimented with drugs to possibly to try and access, you know, there's, you know, in the 60s, trying to search to access them. To this day. Yeah. <laughs> but they don't know that it's much easier than they think. That's what they don't, it's much, much easier than you think. Why go and take side effects. And there's also side effects. <laughs> Meaning, you could lose your world with drugs completely. Yeah. Here, the most that will happen is you'll break a vow. So, but you won't lose your world. If we break a vow, then we have to go to three dis- um, witnesses, and you have to say, isn't there... No, that's a nether. Why do I think it's so That's a nether. That's isn't something that I don't way? want to do. Yeah. Oh. I made a nether, and now I want to uh, recant on it. Okay. So I have to find uh, three people that I can say, that, uh, what is it in the end? It's just psychology. Because I'm saying, if I would have known that I would have come to such and such a situation, I wouldn't be able to keep my nether, Mm -hmm. then uh, I wouldn't have made the nether in the first place, and that's enough to uh, cancel it. So that's a nether, is shuvah. Shuvah is different. Okay. A nether is also something that you do, that that, that you can do. uh, You make a lido. Actually, I'm not sure that it's not nifad also. Madam, no, madam. It's not. It's not like the nun there is from the paw. It's not like nishba, where the nun is added to the paw to the root. So with the shvua, if you don't do it, what do you just do teshuva right there and then, or what is then? Again, if you don't say anything, (laughs) so you don't even have to do teshuva. But where you making the vow then in your head? Can you? It's an internal. Uh Aha. You don't have to articulate it. You don't have to it's a, a yearning to be okay, Jew. Okay, okay, okay. It's really it's here kind of it, it, it's, it's, this is like uh, one of the strongest tools that you have. Mm-hmm. So it so it's like at that moment, if a person uh, going back to to the story of, the, of, of couples therapy, you say at that moment I made a vow. Mm-hmm. And so we said they're going to do this when they get married. They can't really make a vow, but they still do it. And it helps. Apparently it, helps, it helps, but it doesn't make it happen But for you sure. have to do it all the time. Yeah. <laughs> it's not something you can do once and then like send and forget about it. You have to consciously continue to do it. But this is, this is what creates the situation where I can be uh, uh, loyal and dependent. And... and and, and somebody that can be dependent on. Okay? <coughs> so let's see, see something more here. You 
said you had practical pro process. <laughs> uh, like, did I hear that there was a practical kind of process? Okay, so this is a practical stuff. tool. Just this idea of the thought okay. of it, the even thought without of it, articulating. Which is okay. Okay. Now, the truth is that this is why, we'll get to these stories later, but I'll say one right now, that over the years, in the, this is exactly where, where people um, became uh, weary of, uh, of, of Kabbalah. There's one story in the Talmud that got everybody scared. Some people might think that it's the story of the four that went into the okay. orchard, into the Pardes. And Ben Azai, he, uh, he came out, and he wasn't all, altogether with it. <laughs> and Ben Zoma, he died from it. So people think that's the thing that scares everybody, but uh, it's not really the one I think that... Uh, that got uh, everybody's attention. Well, the, the other story is much stronger. Okay. It's a story about Rabbi Hanina ben Taradion. Rabbi Hanina ben Taradion, he was married to... Let's see if I can remember. To Bruria's sister. It was Rabbi Meir. They were all students of Rabbi Akiva. And Rabbi Hanina ben Taradion, so somebody asked here, is vow intent? So we said that vow is not just intent, it's, it's what allows us to have intent. But usually we don't have intent. So we said that David Amelch makes the vows in order to have intent in the actions that he, intention is the word, to have intention, to be holding something inside his head while he's performing the actions, so that they're not just empty actions. And again, the vow that, that we make is in our heads. We don't, we don't articulate anything. But Rabbi Hanina ben Taradion, he did articulate. What did he articulate? He articulated God's name. He was a sofer. He was a sofer. He wrote Sifre Torah. And whenever he came to one of God's names, he would say it. So of course he went to the mikveh before, he was all pure, and, and so on. And even there's, a, there's even uh, an opinion that he was pure entirely, even from Tumat Met, that they had Paladuma still, they had remnants of it still. This is just after the destruction of the Temple, or maybe even just before. So, he would articulate God's name. Why? What for? So it says specifically that he did so in order to bring the redemption. Meaning, wasn't just articulating in the, in the sense of, you have to understand, what, what's so great about articulating God's name? I think with, with every, without everything we've discussed, it just sounds like magic, some hocus-pocus. If you say God's name, something great happens. What? Why? Uvishmoti Shavea means that when you articulate Hashem's name, you're bringing the future into the present. That's what it does. Hashem's name, when you think about it, that's what it means. Right? It's Yud K Vav K. What's the Yud? The Yud is Otiyote Itan. It will be. And like Hashem says, Ekiya Asher I will be what I will be. There is also Elohim that is here in the present. But, the simple shot of it means that this is the future. Hashem's name is the name of the future. So if you articulate it here in the present, what are you doing? You're bringing the, the future into the present. That's what he was trying to do. And because of that, he was caught by the Romans, and eventually he was executed. What do you mean because of that? Why did he get caught? Because why was he... It wasn't forbidden then to write a Sefer Torah. Oh, he got caught for writing it. So he got caught. How did he get caught? Apparently because he, there's one word that he kept saying out loud. 
But didn't he become a, an Apichorus? No, 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 this is Rabbi Hanina ben Taradion. It's not, it's not Elisha ben Avriya. Okay. You're talking about Elisha ben Avriya? That's the story of the four that went into the Peladis. Oh, so this is not the this, okay. this is the other story. Okay. Thanks. And this, I think, is the story that really got everybody concerned. And the, because really, the only imposition that was placed that, that is not a technical imposition like age or something else, it's always true is not to articulate Hashem's name. Why? Because we saw what happened in the end. Even we though it was for the best... The name, do we? What? we don't know the name anymore, do we? So, so the UK case just... Uh, so, uh, so, right. all, kinds of, uh, okay. all kinds of excuses about why not. But the, the bottom line is because of Rabbi Hanina Ben Taradion's story. That he tried to bring it. This was the worst time in the history of the Jewish people until then. It was either just before the destruction of the temple or right after. But the situation was very dire. And he felt that this would bring in the future. It would bring Hashem into the present. Because again, what is Hashem? Hashem is the future. That's what the shot of His names means. Yud Ke Vav Ke means He will be. I thought it was all of them. He will, He was, He is. So we explain that even that Yud, like the Tanya explains, even that Yud can mean um, perfect, I guess it's called perfect present or something like that. A present that's continuous. Kacha ya'ase iyov kolayamin. Ya'ase, even though it means will do, it means he is constantly doing. So you can also understand it as con- connected to present. Continuous present. Continuous present. How do you get the past out of it? That's that's more difficult. Yeah, well. <laughs> I don't know how you get the past. You it says have, I, that, that his name means Hayahu Vaviyeh. It's sweetening. It's sweetening. It's sweetening. It's sweetening. It's sweetening. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. You, 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 you hit it exactly. That's really what it means. To bring the, the, the future into the present, that's sweetening. You're trying to sweeten the present. Isn't that what his name in the Shem saw, uh, the Baal Shem saw? So more simply than that, that's how we understand. Remember, we, we told the story about Rabbi Yeshua ben Levi, who met the Mashiach, and he asked him, when are you coming? He said, today. So the way to understand today is that he's swearing. He's trying to bring the future into the present. That's why when the Rambam says, I believe in the coming of the Mashiach, he doesn't say, I believe in the coming of the Mashiach eventually. Because if you say eventually, you haven't said anything. Because I know that eventually, that's how it will be. The whole point is to bring the future into the present. And when you think about it, everything is based, all of Yiddishkeit is based on this simple concept. That really, we're working to bring the future into the present. All the morality really is, look beyond the present moment into the future. Bring the future into the present. What does it mean to be moral? Be better than it is now. <laughs> that you're looking at the bigger picture. That's what morality means. Musal, in that sense. Sumera, why? Aseto. Because if you, if you refrain from evil, you can do good. But if you act evil now, so there's no, no promises about the future. The future is always good. And we're borrowing from it, we're taking from it into the present. It's, it's the opposite of how people look at, at marriage, for instance, today. People look at marriage as building the future. On the present. They're looking at it as, as, as right. at the present. <laughs> right now, it's good together. Ah, what will be in the future? Who knows? But the real essence of it is that the future is... They don't think they're going to be building the future on the good present? Right now, as long as the present is still good. Meaning that the future is borrowing from the present. But But the truth is that it has to be completely the opposite. That I'm building my future... Sorry, building my present based on the future. Like what we just went through about with the Amorites, 
testimony in the presence of seeing the suffering of Am Yisrael is how do we bring this principle? First of all, who said that you can be Menachem, somebody who's, uh, who's with his, his uh, loss in front of him? When the loss is right in front of you at this moment, I don't know if uh, you should take the, the state of, of telling the person. No, it's, no, it's going to be. How do we, by observing but, it or being but, there and experiencing But I to myself, I have to say that all the time. It will be good. It will be good. This yeah. is good. This is good. Because this is good, as already they've said. That's gamzula tovan. That's a very high level that I've already brought the future into the present. You're seeing a kid being boxed in his face. This is good. Right. This right. is good. We don't understand it. It's beyond. No. I know that no. It's that's emunah. No. That's, that's so immature emunah. That's just emunah. Uh huh. Gamzula tova is the story that Nachum Ish Gamzu had that the dust itself is now miraculous. He's stuck with a, a box full of dust. And this is the great present that he's brought the Roman emperor. And what does he do with it? What can you do with something like that? This dust, this will vanquish all your enemies. This dust itself is already changed. No. In your head. Yeah, you don't have anything. You just, you know, you're holding on to, and they're coming with their backing. Not, a, not everybody can, can do this in every situation. Well, if you, she's asking you how you would do it. I don't know if I could do it at that situation. How would you try in that to do situation. it? But I, but I look at smaller things that I go through in my life, and I say I'm stuck in traffic. Okay. How do you get traffic to clear up? How do you get it to move? Yes, God. You see yourself already arrived to reach your destination. No, I'm already where I need to be. No, exactly. Well, what can you really do about it? You are where it is. In your head, you can. See I have to bring the future into the present, not not bring the present into the future. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I'm already doing what I need to be doing. That's a very important uh, distinction. Distinction, which is it's very different. It's not to imagine how I'll be already in the future. Okay? Mm -hmm. It's to bring the future into the present. Okay, that's a more example. Like, okay, so now, now we'll get into yeah, okay. a very important... Uh, just... The end of the process here is essential. Without understanding this, the whole thing doesn't work in my opinion. Yeah. So there's a point in it that you're saying that you're stationary. Then not right, everything right, right. looks like you're moving. So. Right, exactly. Right, right. okay. So Let's see. Okay. So here we have, remember, we have four stages. Emuna, Ratzon, Sechel, and Ri'ya. I say. How do they stack up in terms of what are they, past, present, or future? So there's an Emuna that's beyond everything. It's not the emunah we're talking about. There's a emunah that Hashem says, even the prophets have not seen. Meaning it's not even in the future. Don't even talk about it as related to the future. It's called, in Ishaya, there's a posuk in, in chapter 20, 28, that he says, Hamamin lo yachish. That the man of faith doesn't want anything to go faster. And that's, faith at a completely different level than what we're talking about now. It's not a vision of faith at all. It's this faith that beyond everything that I can do, everything that I am, so on, Hashem is beyond that. That's Amamin lo yachish. But, the faith we're talking about is always the vision of the future. So faith is related to future. That, that's clear. That we keep saying again and again and again. It's seeing my future. What about will? The, the whole process of confidence, we said confidence is the faculty that moves the future into the present. So it takes the emunah, if I have bitachon, I'm able to take the emunah and bring it into my will. 
That's called taking the future and bringing it into the future in the present. Now this is where it becomes a little tricky, but it's not hard. It just says that there's always inter-inclusion. At any point in your, in your life, there's inter-inclusion of past, present, and future. Wherever you are, usually the way people describe it is that I'm in the present, the past is behind me, and the future is in front of me. But that's only a partial picture of what's really going on. What's really going on is the present itself has past and future in it. The simple example is that there's people who even when they're here, they're not here. <laughs> they're either in the past or they're in the future. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so I'm in the past. It's not, it's not, because it's not the past. <laughs> but this is the number one impediment that people have. They're not, what does it mean not to be focused? In terms of time, in terms of utilizing energy that's related to time, it means that instead of focusing on the present, I'm, I'm focusing on either the past mm -hmm. in the present or the future in the mm -hmm. present. Mm -hmm. So Yoda says it to Luke Skywalker, you're always looking to the stars. Even when you're in this moment, you're still looking beyond yeah. it. Yeah. Stop! <laughs> Never his mind where he is, what he is doing. Your mind has to be focused on the present. But that's contradictory to what you've just been telling Hold on. But you can't, when you're bringing the future into the present, what connects to the future? The, the future in the present. That's the will. There has to be a mimutza mechaber. There has to be some, something connecting me, an intermediate, that has, that's, that has legs in both places. That's will. We'll see in a moment how we apply this. But first of all, understand the theory. The theory is that will has half its leg, or one side of it, of, of it is in the future proper, and one side of it is standing in the future in the present. The mind has to be focused in the present in the present. What about the eyes? So if now there's present of the present, what, what's left? Past or past? No. No? <laughs> we don't go to the past. To be in the past is to be a bala vira. A bala is a vira. So there has to be something else. And this is the That's secret the of the whole thing. The future and the present. That's the, even no, the future and the present is the ratzon. The future past the eye. No? So this no. is where no. the That's whole... Two minutes. This Can is where the real... Yeah, the give us a minute. <laughs> What the eyes could be, we've got mind, we've got Emunah, we've got Ratzon. What was the mind? Not future. You remember what we learned about the eyes? Present. Remember we learned about the eyes from the eagle. We said that Kal right. light like an eagle, doesn't mean that he, he easily floats on the air. That's not what it means. It says in the Shulchan Aruch that what it means in, Vesios, in, the, in the tour, he explains Kal means that his eyes are Over. always focused no, they uh, never swerve from the, prey. from the prey. They don't move from it. They, they never, never, never are in any way distracted from following the prey. Once that's why they're called. It. Because, once he sees it. Because so before that's that. why he's called light. Because his eyes are kal, you're not light like or light like float. They, they easily move to follow the prey. They'll never be distracted and they'll go off and look at something else because that's what it means. So it's, it's netzach, it's holding on to the vision. Seda, holding on, so you're getting closer. Okay. Um, but we say eyes, it's Legs. maybe even seeing an actualization Moving. of it at that stage. Say, go, go one more step. You're, you're on the right it's track. Bringing it into reality. No, so, say, say, you... so the secret here is that you can always split it further. In the present, in the present, like we said that, that the mind. mind is already focusing on the present in the present. The eyes already focus on the present in the present in the present. Oh gosh. It's like you split further, there's past and there's also past and future in the present of the present. But the eyes are so focused 
that you just enter the moment even more strongly. You split it, it's a split. You're splitting you split it every single split things. moment. That's how you're you're focusing more, more and more and more on the present. Do you create more time that way? You can call it creating more time, but really what you're doing is you're opening up the present yeah, to, to allow the future to come in. Yeah. And that's what it means. It's like you're impregnating reality. Yeah, well, you got to This, is, this is, what sure is what it means to focus on where you are and what you're doing, which is the key to being able to see your vision become a reality. It's the most difficult thing to learn. How not to be distracted. The eyes cannot, sorry, cannot be distracted at all by anything. You can only do that for an instant. Is that the rapey secret of the yes. secret in the blink of an eye? It's, it's all, all like eyes. that. It's, it's all in the eyes because the eyes are the center of focus in a person. They're what really focus him. It's, it's like saying this is the organ that you have to learn how to use properly in order to focus on the present. So translating this into, into, into psychology, translating this into something you can do. So the will still has an aspect of the future in it. There's an, there's an impetuousness in the, in the will. There's still a feeling of, let's hop to it. It still sees the future in the will. But when it comes to the intellect, the intellect only works when you begin to focus on the present moment. Meaning, how do insights come? Like, insight is the, is the intellect. Okay. Actually, a gift, really. I mean, the truth is, it comes to you like this, and then you have to develop How? That. By focusing on the present. Like in, medita in meditation, say, or... Cause it can so come if meditation is to blink your mind, so you're not focusing on anything. No. The whole point is that I'm focusing on, let's say, I'm focusing on one word in Torah, one puzzle, whatever it is. Mm -hmm. One teaching from uh, Chazal, one, one sugya in the Gemara. I'm focusing only on that. And the focus itself is what opens something up. Mm. Because really what, what you're doing when you're focusing mm -hmm. is you're allowing the future to come into, in, into where you are. It's like you've, you've planted a, a flag. This is where I stand. And so everything has to come to you. <laughs> because the truth is, that's the whole point. Because we're not talking about what I can achieve. Again, this is not confidence. It's not the immature confidence that I had when I was 18. It's a much more mature type of confidence. Remember I told you Chana uh, Rachel Schusterman story about seeing uh, that picture of a family that's about to be shot down by the Nazis. So th they looked straight through them. That, that was the description she gave. So in a certain sense, they're, they're looking into the future. But when you see that, you have no problem looking your oppressor in the eye. Because you're not afraid of the present. Is when, when your eyes have to move, you can't look. It's because you're afraid of the present, so you're like, either going into the past or in the future, or whatever it is. But in the eyes, you see the determination. That's why it's called conscious determination in the end. The determination is what changes things. That I'm here, and this is through this conduit, this is where, this is where things will flow. Where I stand right now. That's what it means to open the eyes. <laughs> it's called impregnating said, reality. At that moment, Yeshuat Hashem keheref ayin. It's the blink of an eye. Because even when the eye is looking straight, it's still blinking. Heref ayin. Heref ayin really is not a blink, but it's how you translate it. Heref ayin is like 
הרפה ממני. It's like to, to calm, to calm down. Erefaim. It also means quickness, like kalut. The same idea is like kalut ayin, erefaim. But in the end, what it's, what, it's, uh, what it's giving a sense of is can you enter the moment even more strongly than just not thinking about the past and the, and the, and the, and the, and the future? Can you really focus just on this present moment? That's all there is. That's what Reb Usher used to say, I only have this moment. It becomes a state of mind, I have nothing but this moment. What, what, what are we saying? If Hashem, what, what, what does it really mean to say that I'm bringing Hashem into my present reality? If Hashem is usually the future, Hashem's revelation is the future, how, how can I reveal Him here? He's always in the future, isn't he? So, but if I'm willing to... He's again, always in the present, To divide too. the present. Yeah, absolutely. If I'm willing to divide the present again and again and again and again, what have I just revealed? It sounds like you're dividing that God. The, that the present is infinite also. So to really focus on the present, it's like I'm taking every moment and splitting it more and more and more. And I'm showing, right, it's, what's, this is what we call infinitesimal, infinitesimally small. That every moment can be split again and again and again and again. So I've revealed the Ein Sof, I've revealed the infinite within the present. It's a different exercise in revealing the infinite and saying there's infinite amount of time in the, in the future. And to bring, that's another way of saying, to bring the future into the present is to say just as the future is infinite in span, the present moment can be infinite also. But the, but the present moment, when it's infinite, it's infinite in a different way than the, the, the future. The future is just that there's infinite moments to go through. The present is infinite because I can divide it again and again and again as much as I want to the point where it becomes infinitely divided. Or inf- it shows its infinity. It's sort of like the difference between how big the universe is as to how, how, uh, how much can you split matter. Let's say you could split it forever. So it's, so it's infinitely small somehow. We <laughs> can't even understand how that's possible. It's also the same thing with numbers, another way of saying it. Maybe this is the easiest way of saying it. I can say there's an infinite number of numbers. That's like the future. But I can also say between 0 and 1, there's also an infinite number of numbers. Right? Because I can keep splitting it more and more. You can say half, and then you say a quarter, and then you say an eighth, and then you say one sixteenth. Keep going. It just gets smaller and smaller and smaller. Can you apply something stuck in the traffic? Yeah. Oh, you can. Down. Okay. Oh, can you apply it to anything? <laughs> to yeah, anything. This is how it works. The, and I've seen the Rav do this, and, I've, and, and, and uh, to tell you that I do it successfully, I don't know how successfully. But at that moment, you have to reveal Hashem where He is, where you are now. Okay. Hashem is not going to be. I'm bringing the future into the present. And that means focusing on this moment as containing a shem. Also. That doesn't necessarily move you through the traffic yes, it faster. Does. It gets rid of the traffic. It gets rid of the traffic. <laughs> if you want. Oh, come on. So, try it. Well, I know people use it for parking spaces. Yeah. <laughs> that really works. Again, what do, what do I then mean Why don't we use it for a few big things? Let, let's let's yeah, think I about something else. Let's things. think about something much more important than traffic and parking yeah, spaces. Yeah, right, exactly. I'm angry now. What am I angry about? That you can't control, you're afraid how it's going to work. Right. I'm, a, right. I'm angry right. about That's the future, the almost always. <laughs> Anger is a, a, uh, a reaction either to the past or to the future. If I can focus on the present moment, I can see that everything is controllable. There doesn't have to be any anger. It's when I lose that connection that the anger begins to come out again. In terms of behavior, you know, this is a, a different way of behaving. It's not, by, it's not by forcing myself, it's not by catching myself, in the sense of holding myself. It's the sense of holding time, as it were. It's not even myself. It's like entering the present moment, that's all there is. There's nothing else. 
I give it, I'll give another explanation. Usually after time, anger subsides. Right, Given so enough time. Up, right? So you just speed it up. So like, you are borrowing like, time also. No, I'm not borrowing I'm just revealing that the present moment is infinite in, in its length, really. Mm-hmm. You can go through as much time as you need just in this one right, second. Exactly. You don't need more than that. Oh, the reason that you so. don't go through enough during that second is because you're not focused there. So there's this concept of, that everybody talks about these days because there's so much distraction of mindfulness. Okay. Okay, and this idea, I, I never studied it formally, but like how do you enter into a greater state of mind, mindfulness? It's like using the Hushu, which makes you much more present. Like you're less in the mind, okay. you're like... What's the Hushu? Specifically, the Hush, the sense, Here the physical now. sense is sight. It's almost like focusing on a point. Mm-hmm. Right. Just like the ego. I focus on one point. The more I focus on it, the easier it becomes. By the way, handling pain is the same way. If a person's going through a very difficult procedure. Just focus on it. There's a famous story about the Mojitsur Rebbe from uh, two generations ago. He had to go through, uh, uh, he had, uh, what do you call it, diabetes. And uh, his foot came to the point where they had to take it off. So he went to Berlin. Mm-hmm. This is in the 1910s or whatever, I don't know what it is exactly. And there's no anesthesia. There was anesthesia. And he requested... He doesn't want anesthesia. It's a 20-minute procedure, and it doesn't get any easier afterwards, but mm. you can understand. What did he do? He asked that, that he be allowed to, um, to, to lie down, the, the way they're doing it, next to a window. And he stuck his gaze on one point, and the whole time he composed the symphony. Mm. He did it. And th- that was what, that's how they describe what he did. He just. But everybody knows this. But that's, that's exactly if you how, know how to exactly compose a symphony. You do this, then you want to balance your exercise, they say, focus on one point. Okay, you're able to find your balance. Okay, exactly. When that's also. Balance, it's, right, it's, 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 it's also. Like it's also. Okay, okay, exactly, exactly. Yeah. You don't want to topple the This thing. focusing is what allows everything to be a conduit, my whole existence, to be a conduit to revealing the infinite right here. That's bringing the future into the present. Um, an antenna would be another okay, word okay, for conduit. Okay, yeah, an antenna. Thing. But it's interesting that it's to the sense of, you know, sight. touch, not sound. That's sight, not sound. Yeah. Sight. That unknown sense of sight. Right. Right, right. Yeah. That's a ayin tova. Ayin is also to look at somebody at this moment and to see the future in the present. Same thing. I bring the future into the present by looking, by gazing at him. It has to be out of love, but it's here. This is. And that's how the Jedi's do it when they look at the. Guy. <laughs> <laughs> Says. <laughs> Okay, so this is just, you know, a small section of the whole, of understanding the whole uh, process, but it's a very important one, because we haven't dealt with the eyes so much until now. We talked a little bit about the ego and so on, but this is probably the most uh, practical part of it. It's this ability, this, uh, so now, now they have all these uh, strange things with, uh, I can't remember what it's called, with the eye movements. EMDR. Which you said you Which is completely is. the opposite from this. But it actually, does it actually helps people with trauma, really. I've known so, quite I told you, if you read on Wikipedia, you'll see that, that scientifically there's no basis for it. So, it's like a placebo. It works at least 30% of the cases. And that's good. <laughs> you need to give people something. So, we're not that you're talking about how to heal something. We're talking about after a person's healthy. How do you, how do you fulfill 
your mission in, in life the, in the best possible way. But at some level, like, with, with, for instance, with controlling at least anger or things like that, I think it, it, it will help also. But it's mostly about how do I fulfill my mission in life. There's, um, there's something easy to see in Shabbos, the same idea of, of the infinite present, that on Shabbos, kol melachtecha asuya, all your toil from the week, should, you should see it as, as if it's complete. It's done. It doesn't matter what state it was in. It doesn't matter what, what state I left my taxes before Shabbos went in and on the computer. As far as I'm concerned, the moment Shabbos came in, everything is done and finished. And in the same token, I can't make any plans on Shabbos for something after Shabbos. And, but Shabbos is Me'in Olam Abba. We said it's about the future. So what's there to plan? So on the contrary, <laughs> you would say, it's all about planning. No. The real planning, if you want, the real What's bringing that? the future into the present is not to think about the future. That's when you... Shabbos is about Riyah. It's all about seeing. Why do I say it's about seeing? Because sight is chokhmah. Shabbos is always chokhmah. You might say that of we usually associate bittel with hearing, because you say in order to hear somebody, I need to have bittel. I have to have nullification. If I want to really understand what somebody is saying, I have to completely nullify my thoughts and be a receptacle for what they're saying. But in the Gemara, it says very clearly that there's a level above that. What's the level above that? Seeing somebody. Not just hearing him, but seeing him. Mm. That's what I think it was Rabbi Chia who said, that if I would have seen Rabbi Meir's face when he talked, then I would be on a high, much higher level than I am now. You may have the, the people <coughs> confused, mixed up. But that's the idea that it says when you, Chazal even say this, when you're learning Talmud or learning anything from the sages, <laughs> that when I'm learning a saying from one of the sages, I should see him standing before me. On the one hand, it's called a Shmua. A Shmua is a teaching, but it comes from word Shmua to hear. So it's really, I'm. I'm, I'm I'm studying a hearing, okay, a, a, call it a testament maybe, from, from the sage. But it's not enough to study what he said. It's not enough to have nullification in my ears. I have to have nullification in my eyes. To have nullification in my eyes, then I see him standing before me. And anyway, in the Talmud, there's many, many uh, descriptions that show that nullification in the eyes is greater than nullification in the ears. There's also, when uh, Rashbi came out of, the, uh, uh, out of the cave, there's this Natan Boy, sorry, not Rashbi, it's about Rabbi Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda ben Baba. He looked at somebody, Natan Boy Nava Saoga Latzamot. He stared at him, he made him into. A, uh, is, is a, like a, like a, like a, uh, Galatama is like a, a, a mountain of, of, of bones. So that's a strange way to, to say that he killed him. Really what it means, as Nasa Galatamot, he returned him to his essence, to his, his highest essence. Galatamot, Atzamot or Atzmut, the essence of the person. So you see, and, and, and this is also how the, the Rebbe always looked at people. The, the, the gaze allows, if it's accompanied with this nullification, it allows to see through everything, to see the essence.
and, and for all of us, that's that's a, that's the that's really how you bring the the future into the present. It's, it's really just a it's like you're splitting the present more and more and more each time. The more you focus on it, it's not 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 to remove my eyes again, like the eagle. No matter what, not to be distracted. Just to be where I am. So, what time is it? Twenty-one. Good. Mm. Just one twenty-one. Not bad. So, do you want to continue? Or? No, I just continue. I didn't quite understand. So, the way I try to to say it is that you can have infinity in numbers if you just keep going down the number line. So, there's an infinite number of numbers, mm-hmm. but you don't have to get to infinity that way. You can just say between zero and one, there's an infinite number of numbers. Right? They're just fractions, but they're numbers. Mm-hmm. Right? You can split it as many times as you want. Split it in first into two, so you have a half. Split that again, we get a, a quarter. Then we split it again, it's an eighth, one sixteenth, one thirty second. You can keep splitting it more and more and more. That's what the eyes do. Mm-hmm. Like they have this ability to split reality. How does that make room the for bringing the, the future? It makes me, like, like we said, into a conduit for the future to come in. Because the future was really in my faith. The, the, what, what causes the faith to come down is that I enter the present more strongly. The vision of faith can come down only when I enter the present more strongly. Um, wow. Do you don't have to go through just say like this four step thing, you're sitting in a this will go back to the traffic of... We just totally focus on the present without consciously being aware of all the four stages. Right, right. because I've already been there. I've been in those stages already. I've done them already. To say so you can that, start at the bottom, like the scene. If you don't have a vision, then, then it's not clear what will come out, but you could. But if the vision is in, like, what do you say? If you don't have faith, then I'm not sure what will come out. You have to go through this process intellectually to bring about the sense of this vision. The idea is that it also gets more and more concentrated. It gets smaller and smaller as you go down. The vision of faith is very, very big. Not everything can pass through the vision of faith. This we said a few times. That it, we said that this is all related to how Tuma goes from a room into a box, into a box within a box. That in the first stage it has to be a big opening, then it's a smaller opening, then it's an even smaller opening. Not everything can pass. We said that there's more detail in faith than there is in reality. The higher you go in, in spiritual worlds, the more details there are, not less. Again, people have this skewed picture. That in the spirituality, why did we get this picture from Plato? Because Plato has this theory of ideals. So all the horses in the world are examples of one ideal horse. And that ideal horse is in the world of forms. It's, a, it's, a, it's an idea. It's spiritual. So if you study... Plato too much, and you buy into his uh, theory, then you think that the higher you go, the less, the less details there are. The details are down here, or the instances are down here. But in the Torah, it's not that way. As you go higher and higher, there's more details, not less. Not everything that, was, that Hashem can think of actually is manifest in the world. And that's, that's a simple, because Hashem is infinite. So obviously not everything exists here. A lot exists here, but there's infinitely more than what. Okay. That's also one of the things that, uh, that uh, people get hung up on. What will, do, what will we do after? Is a usual, so is a usual uh, 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 worry that people have. What do we do after Mashiach comes? What do we do after Olam Abba? What do you mean? You, you just mean the grays the surface of what's possible. More and more will come down. So there's, there's an infinite. Don't worry about you know, what will happen then. <laughs> we'll have infinite. What will we work on once we win against the Yetzirah, against the evil inclination? What happens when death is, is annulled? Don't worry about it. There's a million other things that you've never heard about. <laughs> they don't have to be bad, but they're a struggle also. <laughs> struggle doesn't necessarily mean negative. It doesn't have to be like our struggle right now against death. 
which is a negative thing. It could be that it's struggle in the same way that a person struggles like in a math problem. There's nothing, he's, he's not suffering. <laughs> it's not, like, uh, it doesn't, uh, it can, doesn't, it's, challenged by it's a challenge. Could you describe the difference there as opposite to the EMDR thing? Like, what's the process of that? No, it's just, it's just about the EMDR because there's this, uh, like, Shita, you know, make the person, and, and like, make him lose focus. By making him lose focus, stuff. What is that like? It's like a type of, you could say that EMDR is the opposite from hypnosis. Okay. Hypnosis is like focus on one point, and the point moves, and you're not supposed to. Okay, you're not supposed to take your eyes off of it. That's how it's done. Okay. With EMDR, I think it's the opposite. It's your eyes have to move. I don't know if they use, they use something? Yes, they yes, something it's dots forth? that go back and forth. That's what I don't know. Sometimes, they don't always I don't, I don't know exactly. But in any case, it seems to me like, it seemed to me a moment ago that it's the opposite from hypnosis. But it could be that it's the same thing, actually. It's just another form of hypnosis. Hypnosis doesn't work on everybody. Nothing works on everybody. Right, there's no, <laughs> there's no one uh, size fits all. Okay. Is this something we would take on? It's not very pink. <laughs> First of all, try it on yourself. Try it on yourself. When, when there's a moment of um, crisis. Crisis. Yeah. But why does it always have to be in crisis? Why always be in crisis? This or isn't this actually mm -hmm. more than just in crisis? You were sure. saying when you're client and you are healthy, can you can start can focusing on can. this. Can. Not can. so much. This is thing. especially for the things. Let, let me say this. I said, I said this before. The number one thing that, that makes that impedes people from being able to achieve their goals is that they're not focused. Right, we're the generation. Yeah. 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 So yeah. those gadgets yeah. supposedly yeah. whack us out. Right. So you can look at a gadget and focus on it. Don't, do, don't change anything. <laughs> Could you give an example of what breaking down would be? Like if you're sitting in a fire thing, what would breaking down be? Breaking it's entering time. It's entering more and more the present moment. Can you describe that? <laughs> if it's very important to me, for me to be able to... Uh, let's say I'm in a hurry to get somewhere. What's, what's my fear? You won't get there. That in the future I'll, I'll miss something. Right now I'm not missing anything yet. I don't even know. I have to. I have to get over that. So not to. Not to. Not to try to think take about myself it. into the future. Mm -hmm. The future into me. Mm -hmm. Whatever needs to happen is already happening here. It's happening anyway. I watched that. It could happen in many different ways. It could be that the traffic would clear up. That's one possibility. But I'm, that's not a very interesting yeah, one. Happened to me on the way to Oslo. I think what's more interesting is that you arrive late, and you realize that it was the best thing in the world that you arrived late. Because they started late. late anyway. No, maybe because they started late. That, that's not even so impressive. <laughs> it's that you missed the no. whole part that set up what you need to do now. And if you would have gotten involved, let's understand, that the, uh. then you would have ruined everything. But you're always in exactly the right time. I'm, I'm at the right time. <laughs> That's bringing the future into the present. The same way with Mashiach. It's not that it's somehow something that will happen eventually. It's here right now. What It is here right now. This one, just open your eyes, it's here. Again, Rabbi Hanina Nachum is a really good example. That he, here he is in this situation with a box full of, of sand, and that's what he's giving to the Roman Emperor, and what is going to happen to him? Right? It's clear. <laughs> How could it be otherwise? So he can worry about, will the beheading be <laughs> with a lot of people around me? <laughs> well, what is that? He can even worry, he can even worry, let's say that maybe I'll tell them that this is miraculous sand and they'll do something with it and nothing will happen. Well, he focuses on the sand itself. This is 
the situation here is perfect. It is what it... And, and what happens? And Liao Navi comes into one of the... Really what it means is that one of the guards there has, or one of the ministers has this great idea. And he says, it couldn't be that the Jews are mocking you. So let's see what happens when we throw it. <laughs> I don't know if Nachum Ish Gamzu could have come up with the idea that this is magical sand, you're supposed to throw it. He says, the future is here. It's going to turn out well anyway. So now. And it does turn out. They throw it, and they see that this turns into chariots, and all Shigas being it. Who knows if it really turned into anything at all. But in their minds, that's, that's what's happening. Seems like you're saying the present is good. Well, the present is bringing Because that's what we're saying. We're impregnating, we're yeah. bringing out from the present moment the goodness inherent in it. Mm. It's, la- it's sealed in... It's, it's from the future, really. Because in the future, everything why will be revealed. Be, why does it have to be? Can't we just also can't we, um, argue that the present is good wherever we are? Okay, but I want to make it shown. I want to open it. So, so why not just say, why can't we just say that the present is good? Why not? It is good. That's what we're saying. But it's not revealed. You don't see it. In the future, it will be revealed. And I want it to be revealed now. Don't tell me the Mashiach will come in a thousand years. I want him to come now. I know that it will come eventually. But the point is, Bechol Yom It has to be now, not, not in a thousand years. Again, it's, it's, it all hinges on this simple idea that since Hashem is good, reality is also good. It's, it's just that reality doesn't want to um, commit to somebody who doesn't see it as good. Reality does not want to commit to somebody who will abuse it. I didn't, I didn't get that. That makes sense. Reality doesn't want to commit to somebody it's who It's feminine. It doesn't want to commit to somebody that's going to abuse it. He wants reason to know that you have my best interest in mind. The reason it happened with Nacham Ish Gamzu was because he held that place in his okay. consciousness. Then he's here. He's not, he's not worried about the future. The and present so the is... Ga- it says, Gamzu letova. Zu, this. Here. That's why he was called Gam, Gam, Ish, Nacham Ish Gamzu. Mm-hmm. In fact, we see that how, how did it work at the end of his life also. He had terrible, terrible suffering at the end of his life. But the house wouldn't fall. He was in this house that was about to fall but it never fell <laughs> it was all broken, it was supposed to fall on him and it wouldn't, so eventually they came to take him out of the house he said don't take me out of the house first take all the belongings out first because as long as I'm here nothing will happen fall. the house won't fall <laughs> why? because I'm holding it in, in my in spite of all the suffering that he's going through it's like Zusha also, because then maybe Zusha is, uh, why is it called Zu? Also this. So Zusha also said, I, why did the Maggid send you to me to tell you about how to, how to be mevelech how to, how to say, uh, say a blessing over the bad things? I've never had anything bad happen to me. How? Because he's here, he's always here. That's, that's Zusha, it's a famous story about Zusha. Zusha was learning. And for seven days, he was on the same blot of Gemara. He, he, wouldn't, he didn't move. So one of the younger Tamidim of the Magid came to him and says, Zusha, you know, there's interesting things on the other side of the, of the page also. You can turn it over. Zusha said, I'm perfectly happy where I am. Mm-hmm. What, do you think I don't know what's on the other side of the page because I didn't turn it over? Here, because the Torah is infinite, I'm getting everything that it says there also. This is, this is what it means to live in, in, in this moment. There's a lot of stories like that about Zusha. But that's what allows the present to become infinite. Anyway. Sight is Maybe. inner and outer? Right, there's inner. insight and sight. So the insight is like the seichel, the, the intellect. And the sight itself is the, the external. So I think we'll end here today.
There's a lot to take in. And, but you can ex- try to exercise it. See what happens. Is there a critical mass that will bring the Shiach today? The Rebbe said it's enough for ten people, and then he said it's even maybe enough for one person. But again, it's focusing on, on the present moment as revealing everything. You don't need... This is the statement from Usher, it's so powerful. I don't have another moment. I don't need another moment. What I have now is everything. Like you used to say, that I can stare at the wall and money will come out. <laughs> because I'm revealing the infinite in it. <laughs> Does he have to be living in a cast in that? What? <laughs> But obviously, again, this is not because it's my strange desire that I need this money. It's to do a mitzvah. That's why. That's, that's the, the whole thing is to serve Hashem. I'm not doing it for my uh, for my bank account. Okay. So thanks to everybody who joined on uh, Facebook. I'm glad that this time I wasn't upside down. <laughs> <laughs> I hope what we thought wasn't upside down either. <laughs> and Vezrat uh, Hashem on Sunday, Sunday at 4, Israel time, there's a shear in the Rebbe's Maimarim from Akolo in Yerushalayim. So if anybody wants to join. Yeah, we, uh, it's the men. Yeah. Sunday at 4. It's in, uh, it's in Batei Rand. It's uh, what's called the rap. <laughs> Is it gonna... So there's a cola that works there, not the regular kids, but there's uh, older men. And uh, it's gonna be on here. I'll put it on. I hope if there's if there's a, if I can transmit. <laughs> what, what's it, Tanya? Or... No, it's uh, uh, the Rev is my mom. Okay. So this will be. Yeah, it's not on yet though. It's on, it's on. It's on YouTube. YouTube. How do you get to these things? Just look on YouTube for Rev Egan's room. Oh, yes. And look for the day. Just regular YouTube. But this is not on regular YouTube. No, this is on regular Facebook. What's your Facebook page name? Moshe Gunot. Just look for Moshe Gunot. You mean if I friend you, I'll get all this? Yeah, you'll see it. You can see it, I think, without even friending me. I'm not sure. But if you friend me, I'll more so. How do you see Facebook? I think you can see a person's uh, posts Profile. and things like that, usually, if it's not secret or something. There's some people that don't want you to see, but I don't care. So so I think it's public. Everything I do is public. What does it mean to join Facebook? Yeah, I know. Um, I don't know. You go on Facebook, you open an account, and uh, you're on Facebook. And two frowns. Oh. <laughs> Did you say Moshe Kunut or Rabbi? No, most, uh, no, uh, not. It always seems to be strange if somebody uses a title on Facebook. It's like the big uh, equalizer. <laughs> Everybody's equal. What time is the show on Sunday? On four.